Well, that's a that's a pretty little tune, and I like it. It's a regimental march of the King's Royal Rifle Corps. It's called The Road to the Isles, and I'm sure that a great many of you recognized it. Uh, yes, a very famous and a very distinguished regiment within the British Army. Uh, it came into being on Christmas Day, we are told, 1755. That's a long time ago. <laughs> they eventually went on to become the 1st Battalion Royal Green Jackets, and today they form part of the rifles. Well, there is a point to all of this. I, I'm not just mentioning it because we are, uh, you know, on the threshold of Christmas, and it would be a nice little thing to remember on Christmas Day that these uh, good soldiers are celebrating uh, this important anniversary of theirs. Um, uh, no, uh, it was for an entirely different reason that I have mentioned them, and we'll get to that later. We asked a little while ago if uh, there were any questions that uh, our subscribers had uh, that they would let us know and we would try and, uh, and do our best to answer them. And yes, a, a, a long list of questions came. And so perhaps this morning we can take a look at some of those. But first, let me say uh, hi to all of you. It's been a, a while since we have uh, been together. Uh, you know, I keep saying this I, and I sound like a broken record. Uh, I am well, thank you, thank you, thank you for your for your concern. No, I'm I'm in very good health. I can't complain about anything. I'm just busy, man. I'm just so busy. And then I, I say, right, uh, on such and such a day, I'm going to just switch off my phone. I'm going to lock myself in this room, and I'm going to get down to making a movie. And then something comes up, and something else comes up, and something else comes up. And I'm afflicted with this terrible weakness where I, I, I can't say no to people, and so things don't uh, become quieter for me, they tend to become uh, busier and busier. Uh, and, and I have correspondence that I'm a scene to. Some of you folk have written to me, and I feel so bad about it, you know, I've read it, and I've, I've said to myself, right, I'm, I'm going to answer this letter now, but I'm at work, and uh, it's just not the place. I, and I feel, you know, someone's gone to the trouble of writing to me, and they've thought about what they want to say. I should do the same. Uh, and and put a little bit into it and, and I feel I can't do that at work so I'll do it later and later doesn't come and so I've got stuff that I must catch up with if if you haven't had a reply from me and you've written to me just just hang in there hopes <laughs> ask for a little bit more uh, 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 time just a bit of patience and I promise you I'll, I'll get I'll get round to you in the meantime I hope that you're all well um, uh, and, uh, you know, that this dreaded disease that seems to be sweeping around the world has uh, left you unscathed, I hope. Um, and, um, you know, we all look forward to the day when this thing will just vanish off the face of the planet, if that was possible. Perhaps it'll just mutate into something completely harmless, and then one day it won't be able to, to touch us. Well, um, the questions. Let's... Uh, Let's just get stuck into these, shall we? Question number one. Have you ever returned to Rhodesia since you left? Any friends still there? No, I have not returned to Rhodesia. I would very much uh, would have liked to have done that, but I haven't. Yes, I still know people who are there, and they seem to all have um, mixed experiences. I know one couple very well, very good friends of mine, who are still there. And if I listen to them, they are doing very well. They have a business uh, in Zimbabwe. They have um, business in Botswana as well. And they have a small factory in South Africa, which supplies them with the goods that they, that they sell in these uh, companies that they have. And um, I don't hear any complaints from them about Zimbabwe. They, they seem to be all right. However, you know, I have to say that they are very much the exception. I know other people there too, and, and from them I hear a different story. I hear a story of of hardship, and um, it's certainly not easy. And um, the supply of uh, uh, water, supply of electricity, is uh, is not guaranteed. Sometimes the lights will be on, most of the time they will be off. Water, at one time they were travelling around with plastic containers, trying to get water out of the wells of friends of theirs who happen to have 
um, a supplier like that on, on their property. So it's not altogether good news, I'm afraid. In fact, on the 16th of this month, I think it was just a few days ago, um, somebody sent me a, a little video clip of a farm that was just appropriated there in Zimbabwe, just um, <clears throat> out of the blue. The police arrived with uh, what the lady who used her cell phone to do the videoing, uh, what she describes as a mob. And they just came and, um, you know, drove all the implements off, took what they wanted. Um, and I, th I thought that this thing had sort of stopped at some point, but um, here it was. In her own words, she said, there it disappears. A fully functioning farm, um, just stripped. So one feels for these people. I mean, they've been there, it sounds like, for generations. The place was well developed. And uh, now they're suddenly left destitute as it is. And not just them, but their, their workers as well. Don't think that huh, Sanu PF is going to give any thought to the workers on the farms. They'll just, I don't know what will happen to them. I suppose like other places. Just, you know, suddenly find themselves in the worst poverty that they could even imagine. No source of income. Nowhere to go. It's really really shocking so um, no I haven't been back I do have friends there um, and I I feel very sorry for those who who cannot leave there and who are forced to stay there and to endure these uh, these hardships that they are going through very sad here's an interesting question hello sir do you believe that there is any nostalgia amongst the native people for Rhodesia Oh, you ask a hard question, sir. Um, but, but if you were to push me in a corner and say, come, quick, quick, yes or no? Is there nostalgia or isn't there? Uh, I'd probably have to say, no, nah, I don't think there's any nostalgia for Rhodesia amongst the black people there. Um, in the sense that Rhodesia would represent, say, white rule, I think they found white rule a bit burdensome. So they wouldn't want that, that again. Yes, I dare say that there's plenty of nostalgia for the products that were so freely available uh, in those days and uh, the opportunities that there were for employment, um, to earn a living and to put food on the table and to clothe you and your family. Uh, I think those things are not as as readily available today as they were then. So yeah, people would be thinking of that. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I should uh, relate this, but there is a there's a joke amongst us Rhodesian people, uh, and it goes something like this: you, you know, things are not easy in Zimbabwe. You know, there's, times are very tough. Um, and the story goes like this, that a, a poor Zimbabwe man is sitting in his house and he's, he's really worried, you know, he's, there's no water, the, the electricity hasn't worked for ages, things are in such scarce supply and he's sitting there and he's, he's really feeling quite depressed. When he hears a sound outside and he calls to his wife and he says, honey, take a look out the window, what is that racket? She goes to the window and... Uh, she turns around and she says, it's the strangest thing, my dear. There's a, there's a truck on the corner and uh, he's delivering bread to the cafe. So the man says, well, we haven't seen that for a long time. Mm. And then he hears a sudden st uh, strange sound in his house, a gurgling noise. And somebody has left the tap open months ago. And all of a sudden water starts coming out of it. And... Uh, he runs and he closes the tap and he thinks that's very unusual I haven't seen that for a long time and then suddenly the lights start flashing and the electricity comes on and the room is lit up and he looks around and he's trying to make sense and suddenly it dawns on him and he calls out in alarm to his wife quick darling hurry get me my AK the whites are back <laughs> I don't know if 
Well, we laugh when we <laughs> tell that story amongst ourselves. Maybe you don't find it funny. But <clears throat> I think there's some truth in that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Morgan Chongira I said as much the other day. <clears throat> okay, he's deceased now. When I say the other day, I mean comparatively speaking. He said, <clears throat> Ian Smith, and that used to be the, the Prime Minister of Rhodesia, Ian Smith would be remembered today as the greatest leader that Central Africa ever produced, if only he was black. So that gives you uh, another bit of insight. Okay, it, it, makes you, it makes you ask the question, does it mean that no matter what the white man did or tried to do, uh, it would never have been good enough because he wasn't black? And, and these are difficult things to answer, you know. I might sit here smiling, but um, uh, greater minds than mine have pondered this, and they haven't been able to really come up with a, a convincing answer. Why is it that, um, that this situation should be there? And yet, I, I have to say, despite what I have said up until this point, Despite the things that we have heard and we have read about and the way we understand black-white relationships uh, in Rhodesia, the fact is that I rub shoulders on a daily basis with the Zimbabweans here in Cape Town. And every day we go through a little ritual. It's thousands of years old. It's an old Shona custom. And we will not do anything or talk about work or talk about anything until we have gone through this. And if it is a lady that is uh, addressing me or, or I her, she will cup her hands like this. And if it is a man, he and I will be doing this. And everybody else is excluded. All the white people around us. We don't see you. You're invisible. All the black people here from South Africa. You don't exist. This is only for people from Central Africa. Mwana wevu. Who know each other. What we are saying is, how have you woken up? I've woken up well. Did you sleep okay? Yes, I did sleep okay. How did you sleep? And you know, after we have done that, we will then discuss whatever it is that has brought us together. But for those brief moments, we are not here in South Africa. We are back home. And I have seen this in other Rhodesians as well. I went out to lunch with John von Zale a little while ago, and we went to a, an outdoor restaurant. Um, we ordered fish and chips over there. And as we went to our table to sit down, John recognized a, a black Zimbabwean man who works there. And it was the same thing. <clears throat> he was asking the man, how have you spent the day so far? And, and the man was replying to him. There is this mutual respect. Call it affection if you want to. Go that far, because that's what it is that we have for each other. Yet the one is black and the one is white. But we are as close together, we are closer together to each other than I am to other white people here, and they closer than they are to other black people here in this country. And, you know, I think that in Rhodesia, we were evolving a society which was, uh, in a true sense of the word, colorblind. It doesn't mean you don't recognize a man for being an African. Good heavens! I, I, I could never do that. Because I know the, the fact that he is black, uh, he has a certain culture, which I don't have. 
But I need to respect that culture as far as I understand it, and, and I do. And he likewise, he expresses his understanding of my culture in his politeness. So it, it, we don't not see that we are different races. But what we feel for each other transcends that. So yes, I think there is very little nostalgia for white rule. But I think there's a, there's a lot left uh, as far as um, the goodwill that the blacks and the whites feel toward each other, uh, even to this day. I, I sincerely believe that. Um, what you see in Zimbabwe today is not a testimony to uh, the African man. It's, it's a testimony to ZANU-PF. That's why the place is in a mess. It's communism that's done that. Okay, next question. Could you talk about the ranks of the Rhodesian army? Well, I said earlier that um, the King's Royal Rifle Corps was a very old and distinguished regiment within the British Army. In 1915, the regiment that I belonged to, later the Rhodesia Regiment, um, formed an affiliation with the King's Royal Rifle Corps. And a number of traditions were handed down to us from our association, our affiliation uh, with the KRRC. And for those of you who were territorial soldiers during the Rhodesian War, if you could cast your mind back even further to the time when you were at Llewellyn Barracks doing your basic uh, training, <laughs> you will recall that every morning during your first phase, <clears throat> you were marched at breakneck speed along the road from your barrack rooms to the drill square. 140 paces a minute. Left, right, left, right, left, right. Hey! Do you remember? <laughs> and if you were like me, you would have wondered, what is the need for this unbelievable rush? Well, it was um, part of the legacy that was handed down to us from the KRRC. You bear in mind that this was a very old regiment. And uh, 200 years ago, uh, riflemen were moved around the battlefield at a very rapid pace. 140 paces a minute, in fact. So that's where that came from. But we inherited other things as well from our association with the British Army. And that was our, our badge, the Rhodesia Regiment badge. If you hold it next to that of the KRRC, you can hardly tell the difference. If you look very carefully, you would see that the, the Maltese Cross on the King's Royal Rifle Corps had far more battle honours on it than what you would find on the Maltese Cross of the Rhodesia Regiment. But with the red flash behind them, at a glance, it's very difficult to tell the difference. So we inherited that as well uh, from them. Now, all around the world, a common soldier is generally known as a private. And so it was in the Rhodesian Army. If you were uh, a member of, say, the Rhodesian African Rifles. I think I'm not wrong. You would be called a private. In the RLI, you would be known as a trooper. SAS, trooper. Salute Scouts, trooper, certainly. But in the Rhodesia Regiment, you would be known as riflemen. And this too derived directly from our association with the King's Royal Rifle Corps. So, at the bottom, in our regiment, you'd have a rifleman. Moving up from riflemen, you'd have a lance corporal with one stripe. Then a corporal, or as we sometimes said, a full corporal <coughs> with two stripes. Moving up the rank from there, you'd have your sergeant with three stripes. Then a colour sergeant, three stripes, and a crown. Then you get to your warrant officers. Uh, WO2, say for example your company sergeant major. Um, he would have uh, an insignia on his wrist and it would be, in his case, a crown uh, and a wreath. W01, your regimental sergeant major, he would have a coat of arms, again, 
carried on the armband on his wrist. And that's as high as you can go with the non-commissioned uh, uh, ranks. You can't go beyond warrant officer. Then you get your commissioned ranks, your officer ranks. And you start there with um, a second lieutenant uh, who would have a pip on either shoulder. A lieutenant would have two pips on, uh, on each shoulder. And if my memory serves me right, they were entitled to be addressed uh, not only as lieutenant, but also as mister. Then you move on to the next rank up, which would be a captain. And he'd have three pips on each shoulder. Beyond captain, major. The major would have a crown. I, in my time, did not see anybody in the field higher than a major and that was our company commander. I dare say that there were higher ranking people, but they were probably at the Ford uh, airfields or at the various jocks, that's the Joint Operational Command Centers around the country. I'm sure they were there. I just never set eyes on them myself. Uh, major was the highest that I saw in the field. But moving on from major, you'd now have your lieutenant colonel, which is a uh, a crown and a pip on either shoulder and then to what we sometimes refer to as a full colonel or your colonel which would be a crown and two pips then brigadier which would be a crown and three pips on each shoulder and from there you'd now move to major general now major general would have on each shoulder a crossed baton and sword and a pip and then a little bit confusing, the next rank above that is Lieutenant General. And you might stop and think to yourself, we've gone from Major General to Lieutenant General. Surely it should be the other way around. But no, try and remember that Major General, I'm told, is an abbreviation for Sergeant Major General, which is clearly below Lieutenant. So Lieutenant General, that would be crossed battens, and sword and a crown and then the next rank up and in the Rhodesian army this would be the final rank would be a full general which be again crossed a baton and sword with a crown and a pip on either shoulder and other insignia as well but that was the rank the rank structure of the Rhodesian army <laughs> um, now, how'd I do? I hope I didn't get anything wrong. Uh, you, you can check through it. But that's uh, essentially what it was. Can you describe the extent of sanctions and how severely they affected Rhodesians' lives at that period? And do you think they shortened the war? Secondly, what was your favourite subject at school? You seem like a well-read man. <laughs> Can I deal with that part first, although it was the second part of the question? <laughs> Seemed like a well-read man. Yes, well-read with Western novels. Ooh, <laughs> Max Brand, Zane Grey. These were my heroes as a, as a youngster. I, I read cowboy books <laughs> every day. Um, uh, but yes, I, I did have uh, some subjects at school that I, I enjoyed. And I suppose I enjoyed them because I, I had an interest in them and um, I didn't find them to be particularly hard work. And yes, history was a, a favourite subject of mine. Um, I did not mind English either. And I rather enjoyed physical science. But uh, for the rest of it, <laughs> I think I crossed... I can say I struggled through it. Oh, except for accountancy. Oh, no, no, that, that was easy. Uh, we used to call it bookkeeping in those days. Oh, that was a piece of cake. I mean, I didn't even have to study for that stuff. I just, it, just, it just came naturally. So that, that was also a good subject for me. Um, but let's get down to the, <laughs> the body of this question. The extent of sanctions. <clears throat> the company that I worked for at the time, was a, a very large company and it had um, state-of-the-art machinery and its products were of an international standard if I can say that they were as good as anything yet you could buy anywhere in the world and so uh, of course sanctions came along and um, one would have expected that this would have had quite a big impact um, upon us 
particularly from a particular from a technical point of view with the supply of spare parts and, and raw materials but the company although i don't know all the details <clears throat> thrived under sanctions they uh, set up a um, sort of a ghost company if i can call it that in another land and uh, we traded through them now if you were to think where would the most unlikely place be for someone to set up a fake Rhodesian company, call it something else, uh, and so miss the attention of the the world and its sanctions uh, uh, detectives, if I may call them that? Well, the business I worked for, it chose on the Bahamas. And um, they opened an office in Nassau. Uh, it was nothing much as I understood it. Just a desk, a desk, a telex machine, typewriter, telephone, and somebody went in every now and then and would pick up the orders from our factory for spare parts. And these would be um, retransmitted again under that company's name to the manufacturers in Europe and in England. And the spare parts would be delivered there and then by other devious routes would eventually arrive in Salisbury. So we had no problems busting the sanctions there as far as that was concerned. We had probably to this day what I would regard as the, the finest spare parts store in any factory with that, that I've worked. So we didn't feel sanctions at all. As far as our outgoing products, we um, again set up a company, I think it, it must have been in uh, Botswana because there was an order that we referred to as the BP order, and that was short for Bechuana Land Protectorate. Um, but it was stuff that would go to Botswana, certainly on paper, and then from there it went to a very large customer in Kuwait. And this order ran for years and years and years and years, and um, the packaging was all marked made in England, made in England, although it was blatantly manufactured there in Salisbury and the proceeds of that one particular order I think I can safely say went a long way to establishing that company uh, and um, and really uh, grounding it firmly um, so yeah sanctions didn't do to us any harm there that I could see and there are lots of stories um, I suppose I could go on for ages talking about the things that I've heard, how people broke sanctions and uh, the ingenious ways that they went about it. Uh, so we could have just gone on, I suppose, in that sense. However, there was one type of sanctions that had a disastrous effect upon us. For the men in the street, the greatest thing that bothered us, of course, was petrol. I, I think I say that quite safely. Uh, we had petrol rationing you would be allowed to have so many coupons a month and this would be calculated by some government uh, official based on where you lived and where you worked how far you had to travel every day what kind of vehicle you had and uh, uh, there was a calculation made so many coupons for you for petrol and you went to the service station and you uh, the man that filled your tank you would tell him two or three coupons whatever it was and he would put in the appropriate amount of petrol it made it difficult though because you couldn't like in the old days just get in your car and go travel where you wanted to you had to remember that uh, there was a shortage of fuel um, but that aside <clears throat> the thing that really hurt us from a sanctions point of view was South African sanctions now I have to choose my words very carefully here because I'm, I'm not in Zimbabwe now, I'm here in South Africa and I'm amongst South African people. And they have been good to us um, during the course of, of uh, many, many, many decades of Rhodesian history. But I'm talking about the man in the street or as the South Africans say, young public. Um, Marvellous people from the point of view of support. I can remember one day, just shortly after UDI, this would be about, let's say, 
1966, eh? I'm standing in Stanley Avenue, outside uh, Meikle's Hotel, but, but at what at that t uh, time was the new Meikle's, uh, on the corner of, what was it, 4th Street, I think it was. So, right on the corner of um, Cecil Square. And I see a, a, a convoy of trucks arrive, two or three of them. And the lead truck is a massive thing. I think they were called the Diamond T. And it's laden with uh, 44 gallon drums on the back of it. As it turns out, all containing petrol. And this uh, little convoy pulls to a stop in the street. <clears throat> And uh, a cowboy climbs out of the lead truck, dressed with his frilled shirt, uh, his chaps on, cowboy hat, uh, and six shooters on his hips. Uh, quite a theatrically minded man. South African. He and his friends have driven up from I don't know where in South Africa, stopped all along the way, uh, and sort of garnered support for Rhodesia. And people donated petrol and filled these drums up. So by the time this convoy got to Salisbury, there was an untold, I don't know how many tons of fuel was sent to us from the citizens of South Africa, purely as a gift. Uh, and, and that sticks in my mind uh, that day because it was a very dramatic day and lots of cheering and, and you know, everybody was very happy. And we got that kind of support from the public. I cannot tell you in honesty that I believe we got that kind of support from the South African government. There always seems to be a problem. You have a government in every country and then you have the public and I don't know why the one doesn't reflect the other always in every instance. The South Africans would look you in the face, the government now, the politicians, they would look you in the face and swear blind that they were not interfering in the affairs of Rhodesia one little bit. And yet behind the scenes, they would be pulling the strings and man, they were a miserable bunch of rogues. They, they were oversensitive. They would get upset at the slightest thing. We would, be, we would hear tales of our Prime Minister Ian Smith having offended the South African uh, Prime Minister in some way and being summoned down to South Africa, being taken to a rugby field because the man wouldn't even accord him the courtesy of speaking to him in his office, would take him to a rugby field, sit over there and then mumble through the side of his mouth, I'm upset about this and this and this and, and our Prime Minister, by the accounts that we heard in the street, would have to apologise and then be allowed to come back home again. If he didn't, if we if we tried to be funny about it, <clears throat> suddenly the supplies that we desperately so needed uh, to come through South Africa to us would be held up at the border. And it was always the same old miserable excuse. It's not political. It's not political. We have... We have unfortunately a problem with the railway system. We're trying to get on top of it. We're doing our best. We know you guys are desperate. We're going to try and sort it out. I don't know. One minute the trains are running smoothly. Suddenly, out of the blue, for some reason, boom, there's a problem. Everything grinds to a halt. Uh, we'll try and sort it out. Well, <clears throat> you know, it actually uh, was quite depressing. And it's, it's hard to understand the reason for it. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, the South African government had its own problems at the time. It was trying to negotiate with the rest of Africa and the rest of the world for that matter. And Rhodesia was being used as a bit of a pawn. Uh, okay, you go easy on me, yeah, and I'll put the pressure on Smith, yeah, and we'll do this and we'll do that, we'll do the next thing. I think also that the South African government did just enough uh, to support us to keep their own people happy. They, they never quite got to the point where they openly and in public said, uh, we're not going to help this crowd to the north anymore, they're on their own. Uh, I think they would have had quite a bit of problems with their, their own population uh, had they taken that approach. But uh, I know, <coughs> and... Um, Everybody else who happened to be looking at this movie now, uh, who served in 5RR 
and I assume that this would have taken place in the other regiments as well, in the other battalions, can well remember one afternoon receiving a telephone call at work, all members uh, to report to Battalion HQ. And we arrived there for myself. It was the only time I ever saw the whole battalion brought together uh, in an evening for a briefing. There were a lot of people there, I don't know. So I what is the battalion? A thousand men? But I don't suppose we were that many. Say about 800 men in the aircraft hangar at Old Cranbourne Barracks. And there we were told <coughs> that uh, the Prime Minister had just returned after being summoned to South Africa. Uh, there had been a meeting with uh, Henry Kissinger. Um, our supplies were down to rock bottom. The ammunition that we had, the fuel that we had for our military vehicles could be calculated in hours. We, we were in that desperate situation. Our government had no choice, we were told, but to agree to uh, black majority rule. Well, there was never a problem per se with black, black rule. The problem was that we wanted responsible rule. We didn't, we didn't go along with this idea of, of one man, one vote. We said uh, we wanted a qualified franchise. Kissinger and uh, the rest of the world, of course, could never agree to anything like that. Um, one man, one vote now. So, um, yeah, those sanctions hurt. The South African sanctions hurt us terribly. And yes, they did shorten the war. Well, dear friends, I think we'll stop right there and call it a day. All that remains for me to say this morning is whatever you have planned, wherever you will be, have a very, very Merry Christmas. I trust you'll be able to spend some time with your friends and family and uh, have a blessed day. Uh, look after yourself. Uh, take care. Uh, we will be together again real soon. Cheers for now.